Um, why don't we start with prayer and then we'll see where we go. We'll start off with the Acts reading. Father, I thank you for causing these scriptures to be written. That through the power of your spirit, Luke was inspired to write Acts and John, the gospel, and other writers who inspire us and encourage us to live faithfully. I pray that you would help us to do that as we discuss these scripture passages. Help us to know you, to know your scripture better, and know how to walk better with you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, would somebody like to read for us from Acts chapter 4? Uh, let's see what verses we got here. It's chapter 4, verses 1 through 12 we're looking at. Sarah, you want to take care of that? Yeah, I'd love to. <clears throat> the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other members, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Okay, so let's um, let's start off. Questions, comments, thoughts. So we're following on from last week when they healed the man and the people all got excited and they were standing talking in the portico. But somebody must have gone to the whoever the people in charge and said, look what's happening. Yep. So remember that the Solomon's portico is in the temple itself. So it's something that, especially if you're saying 5,000 uh, came to believe, it was a pretty big crowd. So it must have attracted attention. So I'm sure somebody went running to the priests and said, have you heard what this guy is saying? And especially because if we remember what they said here, uh, he just, or the, the, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. He knows very well that he's talking to the Pharisees and or to the um, scribes and the, and the priests. So they're, I'm sure, not happy to begin with. Do you notice why they're most unhappy though? What What's mentioned about what they really dislike about these guys? The resurrection um, of the dead. Yeah, I find that really interesting. They said mm -hmm. some very inflammatory things about them crucifying an innocent man. But the thing that gets them really upset is they're talking about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So I wonder about your thoughts about that. Why is it that that's the thing that, that triggers their response and gets them angry? Well, you first had the Sadducees who uh, denied the idea of resurrection. So you, you get them against you and then... Yep. Uh, somebody who was resurrected right here and now, that's uh, that's dangerous. Yep. So there's that. Yeah, I know. There's also, it's funny, if you get a little bit later, we find that St. Paul is dragged before a similar body, the Sanhedrin, which is sort of the, the, the top religious body, sort of like the House of Bishops or something you might want to say today. Um, and uh, then when Paul is dragged in front of them and they attack him, he says, he noticed there's some Pharisees who are in the Sanhedrin who do believe in a resurrection. And then St. Paul says, I'm being persecuted for my belief in the resurrection, which was a smart thing for him to say, because then the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin in the council start fighting with each other because they really disagree with each other on the reality of the resurrection. So that's not that it's just a deep-seated trigger for them. They really don't believe in the resurrection, don't want people to be talking about it. Um, 
but I'm sure that it didn't help by the, them saying you also crucified Jesus. Not only are we saying he raised from the dead, it's also you're the one who made him dead. So they can't be too happy. You also may notice that the names of the people that are there, Caiaphas and Annas, were the same ones who condemned Jesus to death. Um, here's another interesting fact. Do you notice what they did with them when they arrested them? First thing they did was put them in jail. Put them in jail. Did it say why? It says they arrested them and put them in custody till the next day, for it was already evening. Interesting note, it was illegal to hold a trial at night. Uh, and yet they did it for Jesus, right? So even here, there's an implied rebuke. You're breaking your own rules. You're not supposed to have a trial by night. But they arrest Jesus, and they do do a trial by night, which is basically to get it done as fast as they can and most secretively because they wanted to get rid of Jesus before the Sabbath came. So they tried him through the night, sent it to Pontius Pilate in the morning, crucified him in the daytime, pulled him down before the Sabbath, and buried him. So again, here's a just a, 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 a little critique that in Acts Luke is giving to them saying, you did, you know, you followed protocol with his disciples, but you didn't do it with him himself. What else jumps out at you about this trial or about, um, you know, their, uh, at their response to the disciples? It's interesting. They were being persecuted for teaching knowledge. And uh, I've heard the saying, no good deed will go unpunished. And I wondered mm -hmm. if this. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, do you remember what Jesus's testimony uh, was before the priests? You know, for what good deed am I being arrested? Same thing here. It's like, it's very clear you did a good deed. And that's the same thing as to say, if we are questioned today because of a good deed someone done to someone who is sick. So, one of the things it's pointing out is to say, like, they, they don't care about the good deeds. It's just you're threatening my power. Mm -hmm. We even find that in the gospel accounts or Pontius Pilate, we're told, knows that they surrendered Jesus because they were jealous of his power. Uh, and Pontius Pilate, you know, I don't see anything wrong with this guy because he knows that he didn't actually do anything to violate Roman law. He just knows that these guys want to get rid of him because he is threatening their power. Here's another interesting thing. Um, so we, let's rulers, elders, scribes assemble in Jerusalem. Do you notice uh, Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, who I already mentioned that they were involved in Jesus's um, trial, but also John and Alexander. So John is a Jewish name. It's the same name as Jonah. So, you know, very strong Hebrew. But Alexander is a Greek name. It's really interesting because, of course, um, one of the things that the Sadducees were criticized for as being collaborationists. Mm. Sort of like under the Nazi era in France, the government of Vichy agreed to surrender and to rule uh, and basically rule according to Nazi precepts. So they turned over Jews and, and did various things that the Nazis demanded of them. So when you look at that, a lot of the people, the zealots and uh, Pharisees and others were very critical of the temple because there's an example. They, you know, a member of the high priestly family gets named a Greek name instead of a Jewish one. Suggests that a lot of them have sympathies in a Greek and, and Gentile direction instead of a Jewish one. And that would have been another sort of point of controversy. Like, you're just too accommodationist. You're accommodating with the Gentiles and you're not standing firm. So that's one of the reasons why we have the Dead Sea Scrolls is that there was a community called the Essenes who camped out in the desert basically saying, you guys are all impure. We're going to set up our own community. So they're almost sort of like, you know, the Amish or something like that. We're just, we're not going to live according to your rules. We're going to opt out of your contemporary society. Those are things like that. Um, ba, 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 ba. What else might jump out at you about this? Oh, that they were quite, um, they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, and they were astonished that they took that they that they took notes of these men. Oh, sorry, I'm doing it. Okay. Uh, were, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They could see their um their knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting too is. 
they had seen uh, these men and recognized them as companions of Jesus. Do you remember, of course, what happened when Jesus was arrested? Yeah. The Peter vehemently denied I, the companion of Jesus. And yet here he is in the very same temple saying, hey, uh, not only am I a companion of Jesus, I am going to condemn you for crucifying him. So a real change in Peter. Another thing that I find interesting is exactly that, Marina, which is they're recognized, like, why are, why are you so knowledgeable? Why are you so good at making an argument here? Like, you didn't go to school and learn rhetoric like we did. And we're given a hint for why, because as Peter begins, before he speaks, Luke tells us, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them. So the change that's happened to them is not that they took a you know course on the internet or something. What's changed in them is the Holy Spirit has given power over their lives. They've opened their lives to the Holy Spirit. That's also what happened at Pentecost, where Peter locked uh, in the room for fear. The Holy Spirit descends, the sound like a rushing wind. And what's the first thing they do? They go outside and start preaching in public in the very city that had just crucified their Lord. So a real change happens to them, and a real empowerment by the Spirit. Another thing I noticed... The stone which the builders rejected. They're they're taking them back to the old, you know, the old testament said this, and now now we see, you know, you should be seeing too that uh, this is a, a fulfillment of, of a prophecy. One of the things that we note happens a lot in the scriptures or in the New Testament is that it keeps having references to accordance with the scriptures. So in Luke 24, Jesus. Uh, takes the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and explains to them from Moses and the prophets, you know, how the Messiah must die. So he's pointing them back and saying, look how slow you are to understand what the Old Testament's saying. Same thing here. He, Peter is not getting up and saying, here's some new thing that happened that nobody could possibly have predicted. He points back to Psalm 118, which is um, that uh, where he quotes it from. And exactly it is to say that the stone the builders have rejected have become the chief cornerstone. So the one who you thought was useless and got rid of, it's like the garbage stone you don't need anymore. In fact, is the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is what holds the entire building together. So really important is, is that again and again, the apostolic witness mimics what Jesus has done. Jesus kept speaking about how the Old Testament points to me and points to my life. And the apostles keep doing that. And what we find in the book of Acts is all of Jesus's life is described, you know, in, in Luke's gospel. But then Jesus's life is echoed in the lives of the apostles. So Jesus is, is brought before Annas and Caiaphas. Well, Peter and John are brought before Annas and Caiaphas. Jesus heals a man who is lame. John and Peter heal a man who is lame. Um, Jesus, you know, is filled with the spirit at his baptism and pours, uh, comes down on them. The disciples have tongues of fire come down on them at Pentecost. We find that uh, um, Jesus, of course, is, is killed. We find St. Stephen is killed, um, you know, and says the same words as Jesus. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So what we're seeing in Acts is a, a playing out of how the body of Christ which was the earthly historical body of Christ as described in the Gospels. But the church is the body of Christ as described as the book of Acts, because the church and Jesus' followers are doing the same things Jesus did. They're doing exorcisms, they're doing healings, they're speaking powerfully, they're being persecuted. All of these things are things that are meant to show us as modern disciples. That this is an open-ended thing where we as the church continue to be the body of Christ in this world. And so it's an encouragement for us to do what Jesus did. And that includes, you know, interpreting the scriptures to understand where Jesus fits in it all. So here's another thing that's interesting, too, is he ends with, you know, that message, verse 12. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. That's also a really difficult thing because we live in a pluralist society and uh, say that the name of Jesus is unique is hard. But I do think, again, like Peter and John are speaking to a crowd that did not value the name of Jesus at all. And yet they're still unafraid to say it. But you notice how Peter, at the same time, though, is telling them, like, I know you acted in ignorance. Like, it's interesting. We spoke in, in chapter three. He did not say, oh, you knew it was the son of God and you killed him anyway. 
what was clear is, is that they were doing wrong and they kind of knew it, but they didn't know the depths of the wrong that they were doing. And I guess for myself, I often find that too. And like some people, you know, we talk about, you know, internet atheists or whatever it is, or, or maybe people have drifted away from the church. It's very tempting to go hardcore and say, ha, you've rejected Jesus and you're ignorant fools or whatever it is. But I think the gentleness with which Peter says, I'm not compromising on who Jesus is. He is the Lord. But he also recognizes that people are in different places and may not have been able to see the Lord as clearly as, as they should have seen. Um, anyway, that was just sort of my thought about it as well, is, is that we know who Jesus is, but we have to be gentle with those who don't know who Jesus is. Um, I think there's some uh, spiritual ahead, sorry. warfare. Sorry, do you think there's some spiritual warfare going on in this passage? Well, I think there is. I mean, clearly... Um, you know, these are the people responsible for crucifying Jesus, right? So there is a real spiritual darkness. And, but I find it interesting, like John's gospel is really good in this, is realizing that many of the words and actions, there's a double meaning that the people saying it just don't understand. Mm -hmm. So Pontius Pilate's a good example, you know, what is truth? Well, Jesus just a few chapters earlier has said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So he's saying, what is truth? Well, it's standing right in front of you. But another really important thing is, is that I can't remember if it's Annas or Caiaphas, but the one who had said, you know, uh, it's necessary for one man to die for the sake of his people. And what he was saying is we've got to get rid of this guy so that the Romans don't, you know, uh, cause us trouble. What he spoke unknowingly, however, was he's dying for his people because he takes away the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a lot of them, they may not have said, oh, I want to, you know, hey, Satan, let's let's form an alliance. I think a lot of people, as, as Peter was saying, were participating in something dark without really realizing it. On the other side, you know, Jesus notices that there are some who, like here, the, the high priest, he just healed a man in the name of Jesus. And instead of them stopping and thinking, huh, maybe I was wrong about this Jesus guy. God gave this man power in God's temple through the name of Jesus to raise a man from the dead, that should give me some pause, but it doesn't give them pause. All they can think of is this guy's troubling our, our prophet or our power. There's a deep spiritual warfare going on. And it's also, what's interesting too, is that the first thing they see is not just um, their, you know, uh, ability to speak well. The first thing they notice in verse 13, the boldness of Peter and John. Mm -hmm. So again, I think one of the devil's greatest tricks is to make people afraid uh you know to sort of fear and so some of it's psychological i'm sure and just because of my psychological makeup but a lot of times what prevents me from speaking the truth or doing something is imaginary fears right oh if i say this everybody will hate me if i do this everything's going to collapse and in fact you're thinking all of these what ifs and then it doesn't happen right i think that's one of the things that happens sometimes you know, even when it comes to doing simple tasks, you know, when, when people have depressive episodes or something like that, it's like, uh, I can't do the dishes. I can't do this. And I think that that doesn't mean that they're evil people, but I do think that oftentimes the devil plays on those fears and magnifies them out of all proportion. So here's an example of, yeah, you got a legitimate fear. These people could kill you, but they're bold enough to say, I don't, I don't care what they're scaring me with. Um, and we learn, you know, in John chapter 21, you know, that, that John um, was not going to be martyred like Peter and the others were. So John's speaking here, and, you know, he's the only one of the disciples who isn't killed for this. But anyway, yeah, there's a spiritual warfare, and I think we need to remember, too, that when we're talking truth to power, when we are challenged, which it doesn't happen very often, clothe yourself in the Holy Spirit. Like, really make sure that you realize, I'm not just fighting flesh and blood. I need the Holy Spirit's guidance and boldness. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that um, uh, I think it was John the Baptist called the Pharisees and the Sadducees a brood of vipers. But um, Stephen said, forgive them for they do not know what they do. So um, I just wondered uh, how you reconcile that. Well, you know, I, I often think of this in the terms that you remember in the upper room when Jesus says to Judas, what you must do, do it quickly. I don't think he's saying go off and betray me. I think he's what he's saying is okay, now's the time you're going to make a choice, one or the other. Mm -hmm. Because maybe Judas was thinking about it. He was halfway there. He was halfway to rejecting Jesus. 
And at that moment, the devil entered him because he had decided, okay, I'm going to fully reject this guy. And I think probably the same thing when it comes to you didn't know what you were doing. They didn't fully know what they were doing. But now they know. And so Peter says, now's the time to repent. Because it's one thing to plead ignorance. It's another thing to learn the truth and then double down. Yeah. I remember, uh, I mean, not a fairly, you know, <laughs> not a serious or the faint of heart, but I remember a, an episode from The Sopranos where Tony Soprano, who's a mob boss, starts having anxiety attacks. So he goes to see a psychiatrist. Uh, and basically, all she does is she, she can't say what you're doing is evil. And she doesn't recognize that he's having anxiety attacks because it's his conscience, right? But after a while, his wife, Carmela, goes to see a different therapist. And she figures she's going to get the same kind of person Tony does. Oh, it's okay. I'll affirm everything. I don't want to judge. And the guy says, I mean, she describes that her husband's a mafia boss. He says, you got to leave her. Or you got to leave him. You'll be complicit in his crimes if you're getting his money, which he's getting from crime. Leave him. And then she comes up with all these things. And I just, I, what I remember about that interchange was he ends the interview by saying, well, you can do whatever you want, but you can never say you didn't know. Because mm -hmm. he had just told her the truth. And then, you know, the character arc of Carmela, she gets worse, right? Because she realizes it's true. Now I know I can't lie to myself anymore. And I can't pretend I'm not complicit in his crimes. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what they're doing is to say like, okay, now I've told you, here's the truth. You didn't quite know, but now you know. What are you going to do about it? And that's the problem, right? And I think that the truth sets us free, but it also, it can also enslave us in the sense that if the truth is laid out clearly and we truly say, sorry, I don't want it, we become more slaves. Uh, and there's only so long you can lie to yourself. Right? Anyway, that would be my take on it, is to say at the moment you probably didn't know, but the Lord doesn't let us live in ignorance for long. He eventually opens our eyes. And of course, with Paul, that was the same true. Like he was one of those Pharisees, one of the guys killing Stephen. But God shook him up and said, you know, why are you persecuting me? And then he had to make a choice. Am I going to keep this up when God himself told me to stop? Because if I start doing that, then I'm going to know exactly what I'm doing. I'm fighting God. And I choose not to. I choose to repent and humble myself. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, anything else before we jump on to our next, because um, we can either go for John's gospel, or we can do first John, whichever you'd like. Okay, we'll finish up on this. Anybody got a preference, gospel or epistle? I like first John. Okay, so John 10 is probably something you've heard before anyway, because it's the I'm the good shepherd. Worth reading. Uh but it's, um, it's probably not what I'm going to preach on. I haven't decided whether I'll do Acts 4 or First John, but uh, let's see what our verses are. So it is First John 3, verses 11 to 24. Elizabeth, do you want to read for us? Okay. First John 3, verses 11 until the end of the chapter. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered, who, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brother, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us and the spirit whom he has given us. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. All right. So, again, First John is a little bit uh, windy. 
uh, I find like, even though Paul is often difficult, he's generally, he's making an argument, right? You can kind of follow along. I just find John kind of jumps around a bit. But anyway, either way, there's some really encouraging and good stuff in here. So I hope some things jumped out at you. What do you think of this passage? What questions, comments uh, come to you? Well, I think John is, is really the one who most emphasizes that love and what love is and, and how we should show it and what mm -hmm. we are if we don't have love. And one of the things that I really like about John is that I think he gives us a reality check because he says, uh, little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. In other words, he's sort of saying, oh, I can talk about love all the day long. But if I don't actually help the person next to me, you're lying to yourself. And I just I find that refreshing because especially in our social media age, it's like you can, man, you can put out on Facebook every cause that you support. You can denounce everybody who's wrong. But my question is, when you log off, what kind of person are you? Does your spouse think that you're uh, a loving person? Do your children think to that? Does your next door neighbor, do your coworkers? Because unfortunately, the people who are often loudest about how much they love humanity aren't actually nice to people. And you you got to be honest with yourself and say, maybe maybe I need to really get my act together. So I, I find that really refreshing. Mm -hmm. Here's one thing that's interesting. He points out a really nasty thing that, that happens in human nature, which is we kind of assume that when you do good, people are going to praise you and love you for it, right? He says one of the problems is that is not the devil's logic. And so he he says that you need to be prepared for when you're doing everything right to still get flack from others. And he pulls out the first example in scripture, the greatest example, Cain and Abel. So he says this, we must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So Abel makes a sacrifice to God and God praises him for it. And Cain makes a sacrifice and God is not pleased with it. And the, the subtext is it's because Cain's heart is not in the right place, right? So you're looking at this and then Cain, instead of saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better next time. Maybe I need a real reality check here. Cain's response is, I'm going to go kill that guy. And he does. And then he makes a flippant answer. Where, where's your brother? Not my problem, is it? So you look at that and you think, why... Cain is pointed out as an example that you should avoid is because here's a person who sees what is good and he hates it. Now, one of the things that I've often thought about and can be a real problem for people is when Jesus says, you know, there's only one unforgivable sin, and that is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Right? But he says all sorts of blasphemies against the Son of Man will be forgiven. And it's tough for people. But what I like to point out in that is that the Pharisees have just seen Jesus cast out a demon from somebody. And then the first thing they say is, it is the work of the devil doing this. They just saw God liberate somebody. And then instead of them saying, look, I, I can't explain this. The only thing is God is doing something great by freeing people. Their first response is, I hate it. And when you clearly see God doing something and hate it, there's something wrong with your heart. And Cain clearly sees his brother Abel doing something godly and good, and he hates it. Because that's how the devil is. When he sees goodness, when he sees God praise somebody, his first thought is always jealousy and how do I destroy that person? When in fact, what our response should be when we see somebody doing something good is, how can I be good like that? And I think that that's the real problem. We all get jealous. It's a natural human impulse, but it's an ugly impulse. When you see somebody succeed and your first impulse is, I feel uh, jealous, and so I'm going to tear them down. And sometimes you see it. I've seen it in pastoral ministry where I've had a person who comes from an abusive family background who basically you know, says, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut off my family. I'm going to, going to do better. And the family attacks them, hates them. Instead of saying, oh, good for you escaping this, this toxicity, it's I want to destroy you. I see that sometimes with alcoholics, right? A person gets free of an addiction and instead of their friends saying, oh, I'm so glad for you. I wish I could be free as well. It's, you know, you're a wimp and you're a weakling and you're not a good friend anymore or whatever it is. 
And there's that ugly human nature that sometimes says, when I'm miserable, I want everybody to be miserable with me. And certainly that's a personality type that's unpleasant. But I think for everybody, that's a possibility. And John points that out. Don't be like that. Instead, when you see a brother loving another brother, think, how can I be like that brother? How can I be like that person? So he says, therefore, don't be astonished, brothers and sisters, the world hates you. Because after all, they crucified Jesus. And as Peter was saying earlier, you know, it may be that they didn't quite know what they were doing, but they knew it was an ugly impulse. It was an ugly thing to be in a mob that tears down an innocent person. But, you know, it's very easy for us to say, how did the Holocaust happen in Germany? Because all Germans were evil. No, because there were some very evil Germans who led the charge and a bunch of people who didn't stand up and would rather be accepted by the crowd than to stand up against something wicked. Same thing with the Old South. How could you do lynchings? couple evil people led up the crowd and nobody wanted to say no and thankfully we're not seeing that right now but you can be bullying people at school gossiping at the office whatever it is you can join into it and it's an ugly little spirit that says i like tearing somebody down and that's that's what happens to christians sometimes when they stand up for what is right and good the world says i'm going to do something ugly well i was just thinking you know, you're in a class or something and, and somebody over on the other corner gets a much better mark on their on their essay. And you immediately, oh, well, that's the guy who's always saying nice things to the professor. Yeah, that's the teacher's pet, right? Mm. Exactly. And it's always, you know, slandering, right? It's like, oh, we only got the job because of his daddy. Oh, she slept her way to the top. Oh, whatever it is. It's like how easily we rationalize and say, instead of saying, good for you. I'm really glad that you succeeded here. Mm. Not an easy thing to do, but that's part of what being a grown-up is, right? Mature enough to say, I'm, I'm glad when I see something good. Um, Matthew, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Um, Matthew Henry pointed out that Abel's sacrifice was um, really a, a religion, um, that it was for religion's sake that he was killed. And I just thought that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a little bit interesting, too, like Abel has offered a lamb of the flock. And so it's a precursor to Jesus, right? The innocent man whose blood was spilled. And uh, Abel was a shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd, but also the lamb. So there are all a lot of rich things that are in there. And Cain, of course, reflects what the leaders did when Pilate said he knew they handed him over because of jealousy. That's why Cain killed his brother. He was jealous. And so those kind of things, they're sort of archetypes we call them because they repeat themselves throughout history um and again just to follow up on what we talked about about you know actions speaking louder than words um verse 14 we know we've passed from death to life because we want love one another so you want to know whether it is that you are following jesus that you are on in his kingdom then look at your life are you loving other people so if you have no fruits of the spirit showing, then you've got to ask yourself, am I really following Jesus? And so he gives us examples about all who hate a brother, sister, and murderers. Because, of course, that's Cain, again, pointing back to. But here's what he says, again, how do we know what love is? Well, look at the example Jesus gave us. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. That echoes what Jesus says in John, a greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. So one of the things that I often do at funerals, because people often ask for Psalm 23, which we also will be saying on Sunday, the Lord is my shepherd, which is all great. But Jesus in John chapter 10 lays claim to that and says, I'm the good shepherd. The, the shepherd that Psalm 23 is talking about, that's me. And how do you know you can trust this shepherd? Well, he says it's true. There are a lot of hireling shepherds, hired hands, who have looked after the sheep, but you know how you can tell the difference between the shepherd and the hired hand? Because when his life is in danger, the hired hand runs away and won't sacrifice anything for the sheep. But I sacrifice everything and I lay down my life. So the whole point about why Christians have held on to and rejected or held on to Jesus's divinity and say, this is really God's son and not just some enlightened teacher or something like that is, is because God's love for us is so great. He didn't just send some servant to die for us because every king can do that hey you um sort this problem out and die for it he says i'm going to do it myself i'm going to make a real sacrifice and i think that you know your friends and you know the people who really care about you if they're willing to make sacrifices on your behalf 
you're sick, do they visit you? When you're depressed and unpleasant to be around, do they still hang out with you? When, you know, you're needing a little help or, or whatever it is, like the test of your friendship really is, are they willing to make sacrifices, changes in their life for my sake? And Jesus, of course, is willing to taste what he never should have had to taste, which is death. Jesus is immortal. Um, and yet, nevertheless, he takes on mortality for our sake. So that's just really underlining and saying, if I'm telling you, put your money where your mouth is, it's only because that's how our Lord lived. He did not just say clever things and comforting things. He lived a life and acted out and was a kind of life that allowed him to completely give himself to others for their sake. Anything else that kind of jumps out at you about this? We might have some time for John's gospel if we run through this quick. Another thing that I find interesting here, actually, just before we move on for a quick look at John, um, how interested first john is in reassuring people who confident whose confidence and conscience are troubled because he says it elsewhere you know if you know you're sinning you know god is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and he says here too whenever our hearts condemn us god is greater than our hearts and he knows everything so you may be telling yourself i'm the worst person in the world and i'm a terrible disciple of jesus but god knows the truth so instead of asking your own heart, what kind of person am I? Ask God. And it's interesting that he says right after telling us about Jesus laying down his life, it's like, do I have any worth? I'm worthless. <laughs> Jesus laid down your life, his life for you. So how can you tell yourself that you're worthless? Because Jesus obviously thought you're worth something. Is he wrong? So that's really important. But also to say it's wealth worth looking at he says by this we know we're in the truth and we'll reassure our hearts before him if we're loving in in action so if you want to reassure yourself i think one of the things that i find just as a practical valuable effort is when i'm feeling low yes sometimes it's nice to have comfort food or something but in the end i i often feel worse right you have a bunch of potato chips or something you know what makes me feel better is when i do something kind for somebody else like I write a thank you note or I buy flowers for my wife or I, you know, call a friend I haven't talked to in a long time. A lot of times it's you reaching out to do something for somebody else that reassures you and makes you feel better. And I think it's again, it's because we are fully ourselves. We're acting like God acts. We are made in God's image. And so we are most ourselves when we start acting like God's. Image. And what is God? He's a giving God. He not only creates he also sustains, encourages, redeems, protects. So when we're doing these things, we're God-like in our behavior. We become more and more like God made us to be. So that's just a practical thing. You know, when you're feeling low or you're questioning yourself, then act faithfully. Let's take a quick look at John chapter 10 then, and then uh, we'll, we'll close up. So we've got about 15 minutes left. So. What do we got here? Our verses. John 10, 11 through 18. Do you have a Bible handy, Marina? Do you want to read for us? Yeah, sure. It's verse 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. but So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Um, the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Oh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise Jesus. be to you, O Lord. So, 
this has a lot going on as well. Anything that jumps out that's new? Because you probably have heard that Good Shepherd terminology used a lot for Jesus. Is anything new that jumps out at you or some nagging question that's bothered you for that? What do you think I've about it? I realized after reading it, it repeats over and over on a fair bit. Yeah, it's a feature. John is often repetitive. And I know we're talking about that in First John. It's probably the same writer who wrote the gospel in First John. But he's got that repetitive saying things over and over again and maybe kind of changing up the order or something. But yeah. I did qu quote this to my daughter-in-law, who's Hindu. Mm -hmm. She felt like she was separate and apart. So I said, uh, oh, by the way, Jesus wants you too. So you're part of part of it. Um, and so I quoted her this and she felt better or, or that or else at least she listened. She says, thanks, Marina. So. Yeah, it's funny because like John's gospel has this many times, right, um, about how Jesus is lifted up to draw all people to himself, not just the yeah. Jewish. And, you know, John is a very ecumenical kind of gospel. Um, and, but it's it's what's really interesting is, is that with the exception of Luke, who clearly was a Gentile, all the other gospels are written by Jews who had learned from the beginning of the promises made to Abraham, to David to, you know, faithful ancestors in the past. And yet they keep showing Jesus's ecumenical spirit about desiring to draw other people. And, you know, of course, it would not make Acts, sense. It would not make sense any yeah. other way, because if nobody, somebody growing up in the jungle and didn't have any kind of yeah. any sure. kind of information sure. uh, was not accepted, that that would not make any sense otherwise. One of the things that I find interesting is when you look at encounters with Gentiles in the Bible, right? Like where St. Paul, for example, in Acts 17, he's in Athens. He's grieved by idols, right? He goes around Athens and he sees a lot of idolatry and he sees it's wrong. But the first thing he says is, I can see you're a very religious people. Uh, mm -hmm. And he starts off in their common point. And I, I've met and I know many uh, indigenous people who are Christians. And one of the things that they often will tell are stories about first contact that were positive rather than negative, because there were some that were negative. Europeans came and said, your culture is stupid. Everything you believe is stupid. Get rid of it. And the first contact that is actually treasured by indigenous people is to say, you know, I can see that you you really care about your creator. You're trying to serve him. Let me tell you about what we what God has shown us, that he has a son. And that this son has come and died for, for you and for us. And those are, I think, you can trace back to why it is that some indigenous communities, even after residential schools, even after all the ways the church has let them down, cling to Jesus. Because they recognize that Jesus cares about them, even when the church hasn't and the government hasn't and other cultures have. That it really matters to them. And because Jesus had said, I know you're, you're seeking after me. And let me show you a little bit more of myself. And I think that's a universal truth for everybody in our culture. Like, regardless of living in the jungle, I mean, you might be across the street here. And you never really found any compelling reason to go to church. Because the only experiences you've ever had with Christians are obnoxious ones. Or maybe you've only ever experienced, uh, you know, growing up in an atheist household where everything about the church was stupid. Um, I think the best way to approach those people is to say, you know, I, I can tell you're a good person. You're really long for justice. Um, let me tell you how Jesus inspires me to be more just or, you know, uh, those sorts of things. Like just to be honest about where you are and where you're coming from and rely on the Holy Spirit to do the heavy lift. Like I don't have to argue with you. A lot of atheists are a lot smarter than me and they may be better people than me. But the problem isn't how good I am at con convincing them anything. I think what the real question is, is, is do I believe that the Holy Spirit has the power to reach everyone? And that uh, do I believe what the scriptures say, that everybody who seeks after God will find him? And I think that that's really true. And here it is. You're showing, you know, Jesus saying, look, you, you may think that you're God's one flock, right? That uh, that's all God cares about. But I got sheep that you don't know anything about. And here he's talking about the Gentiles and saying, you know, I'm going to raise myself up or I'm going to be raised up on the cross, and these sheep that you don't know, these sheep will be brought in, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And I think that that's really encouraging to us, because Jesus is willing to push against the common assumptions of his day, that God only cared about the Jewish people, 
and say, no, I mean, he cares about them all. And I'm laying down my life, not just for the sheep that you know of, but for sheep that you've never heard of. So sheep who, like my ancestors at this time in the British Isles, I mean, they were doing human sacrifices and things, right? I mean, I'm not terribly proud of that aspect of my heritage, although other parts I am. But even the first missionaries to the British Isles, you know, they would talk about the, you know, the goodness of God and about freeing people from the things that oppress them. And I don't know. I think it's just, it's again, like recognize God does not leave himself without witness anyway. So regardless of what your background is, God is already speaking to you. It's my job only to sort of maybe help you hear that voice a little bit. Well, I've been reading um, H.V. Morton in the Steps of St. Paul. And he keeps on various places how Paul, there he was and, you know, preaching to everyone and the Jewish group in, in the city got really upset. You know, this, this whole, this whole, even the, the Jewish Christians, even that it was supposed to be just part of Jew, of their Jewish heritage, part of the Jewish religion. And, the, and he'd get to tossed out and have to run for the next city. Because they just didn't want it to. It, it, if Gentiles were converted, they had to become Jews. They could not just be, you know. And this is the same, you know. If people, indigenous people, are going to become Christian, they've got to be just like us, yeah. which is silly. Which is very silly. And yeah, we've lost know, a ton I, of wisdom and knowledge yeah. because of that. Absolutely yes. right, and poisoned a lot of you know, dialogue with indigenous people because they can look back to times where they were treated badly. And they'll equate that with Jesus. So I, I think, you know, when you look at this, um, it just reminds me, though, to, to be careful that, and I know we're not saying this, but it's true that, you know, they got opposition from Jewish groups because of jealousy. But it happens in Christian circles all the time, right? You know, mm -hmm. some people in other churches growing and everybody in the church that's not growing gets jealous of them and slanders them, right? I know, sadly, I know historically, like the Wesley. So John Wesley became famous as a preacher because he thought, you know, there's a whole group of people that never hear the church because they just don't feel welcome in the Church of England. Now, he was a Church of England minister. His hope was that they would come to the church as a result. So he would go and preach in open air markets. He'd go and preach in places where people who may not set foot in the church would be comfortable gathering and preach to them. Eventually, his way of preaching came to be known as Methodism, because he would give them simple methods, like here's how you come to know Jesus better. Here's how you pray. Um, if I remember right, his, that, that term godliness, or cleanliness is next to godliness came from him because he was saying, like, if you're, if you take a bath once in a while, your life will be better, right? Because, you know, <laughs> sadly, some people, especially amongst the poor, might have poor hygiene habits. And it's like, it's hard to get a job when you interview and you smell and you look dirty. So a lot of these things and upper class people would mock them. And so Methodism started as a movement outside of the Church of England, mostly because when people would hear Wesley and then he would move on to the next place and they'd go to their local church and the local church didn't want them. I'm illiterate. Well, here's a prayer book. Deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, or you know, I'm uh, uh, I have a really low class accent and, you know, I feel out uncomfortable and, you know, I come and, you know, my clothes don't look good. I don't wear a nice suit when I come. And so people would start it, started a new denomination, partly because they felt like I was not welcome in the church of England. And so I'm going to start my own church. And that's where uh, eventually the United church has its roots from that, um, that united the free Methodist church with the uh, Presbyterian and congregationalist churches. Anyway, all that is to say is, is that that division in many ways happened because of the same process we see, which is I've got my nice little thing going on and I don't want you to, to show me up and make me look stupid instead of. And that's just like Cain, right? I don't like the fact that Abel gets praised, so I'm going to kill him. That's my solution. Instead of saying, I don't like the way that Abel gets praised more than me. So I'm going to change my ways so that my ways become godly. Mm. That is always my thought. It's like. Another church down the road is doing better. It's drawing people. Is there something I need to improve in me? Is there something we need to do in a church that's more faithful to Jesus? That's the real question is, what can I do to improve myself? So I think it's here, it's really encouraging because Jesus says also, like troublesome sheep he sticks with, right? You know, the 99 on the hillside and then one I go and wander after in this gospel. 
that sheep's a pain in the butt, right? Mm-hmm. Like, man, I got to go and look after this guy. He's trapped in a swamp somewhere. Mm-hmm. And he does it. And when he comes back, he doesn't say, I'm coming back with lamb chops because I'm sick of dealing with this guy. No, he comes with a lamb on his shoulders rejoicing because the lost was found. So just to, to, to note what kind of shepherd we're talking about, I think one of the reasons that this image is so popular is that it just really says so much about Jesus is strong enough. A good shepherd fights off the, the wolf, but he's also tender enough to deal with the little lambs. And that's a really a great image of Jesus as our Lord, because he really is our Lord. We really do owe him our obedience. But he's not like the other lords we see in this world, in which obedience means go do this for me, go do that for me, because I don't want to do it. Somebody who sacrifices for us. And that's what servant leadership looks like as a shepherd who's strong, loving, and wise, but also can be really tender, tender and sympathetic with the weak. And that's that's an encouraging image. Hmm. Um, and- but, 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 another thing that's interesting, too, is it really does emphasize Jesus's mastery of the situation. Because he keeps saying, in John's gospel, particularly strong in it, he says, no one takes takes it from me. So no one takes my life from me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I've received this command from my father. (laughs) John underlines is that it's not as if Jesus got tricked. Like he was trying to do all this stuff and oops, the devil got the better of me and outsmarted me and killed me. Jesus says from the beginning, this is the plan. I knew that this is what it is that God gave me. And the other Gospels will show us the account of how Jesus has to work to master his human will, because his human will, like all of us, is a healthy self-preservation instinct. But he knows from the beginning that this is his job. He is going to lay down his life, and he will take it up again. And so this is an encouragement for us to put our, our faith in this shepherd. It's not that the wolf is stronger than the shepherd. It's that the shepherd willingly lays down his life because he knows that in the end, that's what will redeem them, protect the sheep. Mm-hmm. anything else sarah go ahead yeah my uh note on verse 14 talks about um i uh i am a good shepherd i know my sheep and my sheep know me it just says a deep mutual knowledge like that of the father and the son and uh i just found it interesting that um uh knowledge seems to be promoted so much in the gospel and I just want to thank you for your efforts to, um, to spread knowledge as well. Oh, thanks. I think, you know, knowledge can needs to be paired with wisdom to know how to apply that knowledge. But that is also one of the great gifts. It's like we have a God who really wants us to know him. So he doesn't say, here's a puzzle, figure it out. Like he's always speaking to us so that the knowledge he gives us is always intended to help us grow. It is not like uh, John has been contrasting, not the knowledge that puffs you up and says, oh, I finally am smarter than this other guy and can make him look stupid, which is pretty much what all Internet discussion is. It's like making your enemies look like morons. It is always to how can I if you're on the wrong way, how can I correct you so that you might be free? Because sin in the end destroys us and that's why we want to free others from sin not to embarrass and shame them and uh if you know that then the knowledge you get is incredibly powerful and i'm really gifted like it's not that every day i love my job there's some days i don't (laughs) some weeks some months i don't (laughs) the fact of it is what's great about it is i i think part of the reason i realized i wanted to be a priest was i love reading the scriptures i love listening to people talk about them i love learning about it and I love looking, learning about the church history. And I also love maturation. I love the sense that I'm growing up. And I love it when I can look back and say, you know, I'm, I'm doing better than I did two years ago on this character issue. And not everybody has that chance. You're just busy. And some people, you know, you work in a factory and you're a dog tired at the end of the day. You just do not have time for a Bible study. You do not have time for other things. And I've got it. So Anyway, all it is is a long way of saying thank you for that. And thank you for allowing me to have the kind of job that helps me really dive deep into things that I love. Mm -hmm. Why don't I uh, close with prayer and then we will convene again next week. Do remember, if you've got anybody that you think might want to join us, please share the link because I do know a lot of people watch us on YouTube. This gets put up, you know, a few days after we do our Bible study. 
but it's always good to get more voices. And I think a lot of people would really appreciate having the chance to chat about the scriptures. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for our discussion. Thank you most of all for showing us who you are. We've seen different snapshots from different scriptures here, but what the common thread always is, is that you've come to make us better people, to help us not just to talk a good talk, but to love a good love, to love our brothers, not as Cain uh, hated his brother, but as Jesus loved us as brothers and sisters. Help us to love in more than words, but in deeds. Help us, Lord, in our discussion to um, continue to respect and love one another. And help us to learn from what we've discussed today so that the knowledge doesn't sit simply in our memory banks, but is used with wisdom and applied with grace. I pray, Lord, that you would give to all who may be watching us later on YouTube just a real um, peace with whatever they learn and that whatever they find useful, Lord, that they might share it in their lives through their actions and through their words. For those who are normally with us and aren't able to be with us today, please bless them and encourage and help them and let them know that they're not forgotten. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye, everybody. I'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.